Check, check, one, two. Hello, hello. Oh, man. Be right back. Okay, hair was going crazy. I didn't look at it this morning. <laughs> Just assumed. But yeah, welcome in. We're doing a little bit of uh, the normal today. So, theology talk it is today, still. <clears throat> let's uh let's pray for the stream father in heaven thank you for this day we thank you for how many blessings you've put in our lives despite anything no matter who we are you have blessed our lives we know there are struggles we just ask that you would um you would make your name known your goodness known that your name would go out into the earth that you um would bring your kingdom and that uh, it would come in its fullness soon through uh, the return of Jesus. And we just ask that you would uh, bless us to, to be a part of that um, movement of your spirit in this world. Uh, we just ask that you would be with the stream, that you would bless any teachings, anything that comes out of my mouth, that you would help me through your spirit to, uh, to watch my words and to be gracious uh, and all my words should be gracious to the hearers. And I just ask that you would forgive us for our many, many shortcomings and our many sins, that you would help us as we forgive those who sin against us. You would forgive us. Lead us not into temptation today, but deliver us from the evil one and just help us um, give us our daily bread today for what we need. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Hallelujah. Um, let's see, we'll start with the Shema, of course. I was typed in Shema, that's hilarious. Look up the Shema, do it. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Ve'ahabta eight, Adonai Elohecha, Beho levavcha, Uveho nafshecha, Uveho meodecha. Meaning, hear Israel, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with your whole heart or mind, in Hebrew thought. Your whole soul or your entire being and your strength. Your exceedingliness, all of the stuff that you have beyond what you need. And... Let's have fun and read the rest. Vahayu hadavarim ha ele asher anochi mitzavecha hayom alevavecha. And these, these are the words which I, and wait. Vahayu means these are, these are these words which I am, I am commanding you this day. Hayom, the day, will, shall be upon your hearts or your minds, is what it says. Kept in mind. Keep them in mind. Keep them in mind. Keep them in mind. Why? As you must teach them to your children. As you, we'll, we'll, we'll do that with two. Veshanantam lebanecha. Wait. Yeah. 
ושננתם לבנקה ודברת בום בשבתך בביתך ובלקתך ודרק ובשיתך ובלבך Uvekumeka. There we go. You must teach them to your children as you speak to your children and speak of them as you sit in your house, as you walk along the road, as you lie down, and as you get up. Uhumecha. There we go. Kuma to rise. Ukshark Tam Leot Al Yadeka. Vehayu letotofot bain nimecha. You should tie them as a reminder on your forearms and fasten them as symbols on your forehead. And Uktav tam al mezuzot betecha. Ukshar recha. Uvish Arecha. There we go. Inscribe them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. This is where we get the idea of mezuzas. Mezuzat. Ah, mezuzot. Mezuzah. That's where we get it from, where, where um, many Jewish people will put <coughs> a little thing on their door frame. With little a little roll of commandments in there, and they're like literally put them <laughs> on your door frame. I get it. I get it. Okay. So, um, we'll get into our random faith checkbook that we've been doing. Four seven. And all the people of the earth sh shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Deuteronomy 28, 10. Then all the people of the earth will see that you belong to the Lord, and they will respect you. That's a better one. They will have reverence for you. <coughs> Yare is to be afraid. But they will, they will, they will respect you. Not necessarily run in terror of you. Then we have no reason to be afraid of them. This would show a mean spirit and be a token of unbelief rather than of faith. God can make us so like Himself that men shall fo be forced to see that He is rightly that we rightly bear His name. And truly belong to the holy Jehovah. Oh, that we may obtain this grace, which the Lord waits to bestow. Be assured that God, ungodly men have to have a have a fear of true saints. Be assured that ungodly men have a fear of true saints or a respect of true saints. Um, they hate them, but they also fear them. Haman trembled because of Mordecai, even when he sought the good man's destruction. In fact, their hate often rises out of the dread which they are too proud to confess. Let us pursue the paths of truth and uprightness without the slightest tremor. Fear is not for us, but for those who do ill and fight against the Lord of hosts. If indeed the name of the eternal God is named upon us, we are secure. For, as of old, a Roman had but to say, Romanus sum, I am a Roman, and he could claim the protection of all legions of the vast empire. So, everyone who is a man of God has omnipotence as his guardian. And God will sooner empty heaven of angels than leave a saint without defense. Be braver than lions for the right, for the God is with you. <clears throat> Be braver than lions for the right. I like that. For righteousness, for the right things, for... For goodness, be braver for those things, and God is with you.
this is good because a lot of us feel like we're on our own and serving the Lord and that he just wants to be served and isn't involved. But that's not what scripture says. Intimately involved with all of his creatures and creation, but especially those who bear his name and live according to his purposes and try to further the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's just how it is. The kingdom's coming either way. We just need to get on board before it comes. Um, let me do this. I need check. Chickity check it. All righty, all righty. Let's continue. I believe we're starting Acts chapter 3 today. I think we can do that. We'll see how far we want to get here. Hey, Willow, come here. What are you doing? What are you looking at? What you doing with your face? Oh, no. No, oh, my little fluff dog. She's so cute. My little, my little mascot. Willow's a mascot. Okay. Oh, well, I know. I know. I know. Okay, pardon me, I'm doing some jaw exercises. Okay, Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. Peter and John had frequently, are frequently mentioned together. Also with James, John's brother, apparently being both good friends and business partners. Luke's portrait, Luke portrait, Luke's portrait first of Peter and subsequently of Paul provides much of the scholarly ground for claiming that Acts falls into a biographical genre. Given the book's re relative extended length, Luke is both able at the pains both able and at pains to supply considerable biographical detail on both figures. In doing so, he presents most of the various types of biographical material found in rabbinic literature. The latter does not contain a developed biographical form, but employs a more anecdotal style based around precedents, responsas, scholastic debates, exempla, ec encomia, miracle stories, and deathbed scenes. Precedents represents, represent stories which account actions of halakhic significance frequently introduced by the term ma'ase, if a man was taken out beyond the Sabbath limit, by Gentiles, or even an evil spirit, he may only move within four cubits. It happened when he came from Brudasium, and when their ship was sailing in the sea, that Rabban Gamaliel and Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah walked the whole length of the ship, but jo Rabbi Joshua and Rabbi Akita did not stir beyond the four cubits, since they were minded to apply to themselves the more stringent rulings. The incident... Yeah. Yeah, the incident of Cornelius may have represented a halakhic precedence in the eye of the early community. That's when we're going to get to chapter 11. Responsa figure stories in which a sage answers a question posed by a pupil or by some inquirer, whether genial or hostile. 
the disciples question to Jesus in 1.6, which in certain senses may represent a death story, is perhaps an example of this type as are Peter, John, and Paul's appearances before the Sanhedrin, the latter property being legal tri- the latter properly being legal trials. Scholastic debates characteristically involve disputes between authorities on halakhic issues, such as the reference to the Apostolic Council. Exempla are stories designed to commend certain values or certain virtues, examples of which abound in Acts. Such scholars also see in Luke's portrayal of Paul an economium, or a story designed to praise a certain master. Throughout the book, Luke contrasts the behaviors of Jesus' disciples with the less favorable conduct of others. Many of the reasons behind the composition of the rabbinic anecdotes also lies behind Acts, albeit in slightly different format. The sage was a teacher who gathered around himself a circle of disciples who not only listened to their master's words and told stories to glorify him and or to detract from his peers, but also closely analyzed his actions. The conduct of a competent halakhic authority serving as an important source of law, per se. Paul's farewell to the Ephesian elders and Jesus' farewell to the disciples at his ascension are types of deathbed stories. In considering Luke Acts in terms of a form of biographical genre, it is striking that no traces exist of biographies of any of the sages, either in the form of some now lost collections of tales or in any tendency to combine diverse stories about one or other sages into a life. The enigma of this circumstance derives not only from the existence of the New Testament Gospels, but also from the uh, biblical precedents, such as detailed accounts of Moses or David. The fact that Peter and John are going to the temple to pray corroborates Luke's statement in 246 that the early community were, quote, day by day continuing with one mind in the temple. The reference to uh, the prayers in 242 may well allude to public prayer times, i.e. in the temple, especially the passages 246 and 47 parallels the summary in chapter 5. According to the majority of contemporary sources, such prayers appear to have been associated during this period with the daily morning and evening whole offerings. Luke's designation of the time as the hour of prayer reflects the fact that prayers and Torah readings were added to temple services during this period. The cultus was based upon the talmid, or whole offering, which is composed of two-year-old lambs, one offered in the morning and the other in the evening, accompanied by the uh, mincha, the grain offering, and drink offering, all sacrificed as, quote, com- the communal burnt offering throughout your generations, Exodus 29, 42. The word tamid, sig- uh, s- the word tagmi, signifying the, uh, s- the sacrifice's regularity. During the Second Temple period, the daily whole offering was made at daylight by nine, ten, eleven, or twelve priests, a ram being offered by eleven, its flesh by five, and the innards, fine flour, and wine by eat by two each. The bullock was offered by 24 priests, the parts of the animal by 15, and three each for the inwards, fine flour, and wine. Interesting. I didn't know any of these details. These sacrifices form the essence of the temple service and the main function of the altar. An uninterpreted offering... An uninterrupted offering being viewed as the paramount importance even during the times of siege and war, since the hour of the evening sacrifices seems to have been changed from twilight to mid-afternoon sometime during the Hellenistic period. Luke's reference to the ninth hour appears to allude to the afternoon sacrifice known by the name of the grain offering as Mincha, again. which some of the texts suggest that the Amidah was recited three times daily. The Essenes and the Therapeutae both prayed twice a day. The whole offering sacrifice seems to have formed the model for the synagogue morning and afternoon services. The prayers recited by the Ma'amadot, the lay deputations, recited by the deputations' own cities in, in parallel to the offering sacrificed by the 24 priestly courses in the temple, represented the morning and afternoon daily holes offerings, together with the additional offerings on the Shabbats, on the Shabbats, Sabbaths, new moons, and festivals. Talmudic sources indicate that during the second temple period, Mincha, the afternoon prayer, could be said at any time between the ninth hour and sunset. In Jerusalem, worshippers apparently vacated the area 
in front of the entrance hall and gathered for prayer in the temple courts, particularly during the afternoon incense offering following the whole offering service and additional offerings. Contemporary sources describe how people flocked to the temple in order to pray, receive the priestly benediction, and to prostrate themselves upon hearing the, si the singing of the Levites. This just, uh, I'm going to skip this. This is a long paragraph from Sirach, I believe, and uh, references to other uh, Jewish traditional writings about what was happening, F the finishing the service at the altar, high priest, all, did all these things. Yep. The morning incense was offered between the tossing of the blood and the burning of the organs. The afternoon incense between the burning of the organs and the drink offering. The preparation of the incense was considered to be one of the day's most important rituals due to the fact that it was performed within the temple precincts and by special lottery, the latter being confined to priests who had never yet burned incense. The incense was prepared once a year and divided into 365 minas, half of which were burnt in the morning and the other half in the afternoon. Twice a year, it was sent to the mills. The Tanakhic source specifies seven extra const constituents to those mentioned in the Torah. Together with the Sodom salt, ingredients designed to send up in smoke, and as an a yet as uh, an as yet unidentified flower, prayer in this context almost exclusively refers to the Tefillah, the Shmona, Ezra, and the 18th benediction, the Amidah, either the full number reciting during the week or the shortened version said on Sabbath and festivals. The pattern of blessing became standard for the this pattern of blessing became standard for all liturgical occasions, including Torah readings. Recitation of the Shema, the Kaddush, Kaddush, and the Havdalah, the ceremony marking the end of the Sabbath. While the Shema was primarily the private a private prayer, it appears to have been combined with the Amidah as early as the Second Temple era, being recited antiph antiphonally when the congregation assembled in the morning service. It is composed of verses from Deuteronomy 4 through 9, like we usually read. 11, 13 through, uh, chapter 11, 13 through 22, and Numbers 15, 37 through 41, preceded and followed by one or two of the benedictions, and was recited together with the Decalogue during this period. The Ten Commandments, if you don't know what Decalogue is. Although the formulation of many public prayers apparently took the definite structure prior to 70 CE, the numerous Tanakhic and Amoratic dicta and disputes demonstrate that the text remained very fluid. For this reason, together with the lack of sources, it is virtually impossible to identify any original versions of these prayers, basically is what he's saying. The temple, its vessels, and even the high priest's vestments are depicted in contemporary text as representing the whole universe, including the heavenly host, said to have been contemplated before the world's creation, and as constituting a blessing for Israel and for all the nations of the earth. The whole Jewish populace brought their obligatory sacrifices, wave offerings, tithes, and first fruits to the place where God had put his name to dwell, the temple, worshipped and prayed, and, in the second temple period, studied Torah and posed halakhic questions. In other words, how do you walk out these commandments? That's what halakha is. I always want to bring that into people who aren't familiar with that, that term. In Jerusalem, it acted as a geniza for the laying up of the holy books, sacred by virtue either of their origin or their subject matter, where they were always, uh, where they were available for use, where appropriate, by the temple officers, the priests, and the Levites. Problems related to the transmission of the text and the authenticity of various biblical books were checked in the temple against the scroll of the temple court, while copyists and correctors sat in its court and wrote scrolls for both Ezra and uh, for both Eretz Israel, for the land of Israel, and the diaspora. It likewise served as a public archive, and an archive for the priestly genealogies. The priests who served in the temple were supervised and counseled by a permitted staff of officers who presided over the daily worship procedures and weekly division of priests. Rabbinic texts list office officials in charge of bird offerings, allotments, libations, clothing, and other items, 
These duties were generally passed on as an inheritance from father to son. Numerous Talmudic, sor Talmudic sources recording the complaints lodged against the various priestly houses for misuse of their possessions. As Luke indicates, the height of the Temple Mount from the surrounding ravine means the most access to it required going up. Right? That's what, that's what I mean, that's what Aliyah is, to go up. Aliyah uh, is what we say for any person in the world who wants to make, uh, who's Jewish, who wants to go and be, uh, live in Israel, they can make Aliyah or go up to Israel. In the same way people say going up to the temple. Of the four gates, two led to bridges connecting to the temple to the upper city, which primarily served the, arist the aristocracy. The Mishnah only designates the Kiponis gate on the west that served for coming in and going out. The normal entrance was through the imposing stairs to the broad Hulda gate on the southern side of the mount, where pilgrims turned right and customarily circled the inner walls before prostrating themselves 13 times in front of the gate leading to the inner courts in thanksgiving for the temple's deliverance out of the hands of the Gentiles. Okay, let's, uh, let's do this. I wanted to get a picture of the actual, but this is good enough. This is the southern, this is the group I went with to Israel. This is the southern steps. This is the, this is the wall right here, the southern wall. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I've been there. It's pretty cool. Southern wall, southern entrance. Now we're going to move it to verse 2. 3 verse 2. Why is it highlighting that? Anyway. And a man lame from birth was being carried up. And a certain man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they had used to set down every day at the temple of the at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful in order to in order to beg alms of those who are entering the temple the notion lame from his mother's womb seems to indicate that the beggar suffered from a congenial medical problem although it is impossible to know in its, its cause while uh, kolos the word kolos can also refer to hands it generally denotes those crippled of the lame or lame in the leg the t the the Tanakh describes Jonathan's son as being crippled in the feet as a result of childhood fall, and Jacob as limping following the wrestling with the angel. The Midrashic tradition claims that B Balaam was lame in one foot, Samson in both feet, and that lameness is the consequence of unnatural cohabitation. Ooh. The Messianic age is portrayed in terms of wholeness in which which includes the lame leaping like a deer, Isaiah 3, 35, 6. The Talmud describes a condition known as shigrona, or hip disease, apparently a form of uh, lumbago, or sciatica, from which the proposed remedy was to take a pot of fish brine and rub it 60 times around one hip and 60 times around the other. Interesting. <laughs> this form of illness was apparently fairly common disorder, in contrast to the severance of the spinal cord, which was much rarer. Talmudic sources, uh, Talmudic literature also discusses between, uh, distinguishes the, these two different, the former being a person lame in one foot and another lame in both feet. Okay. The meaning of uh, chiger seems to allude to the binding in the sense of limpness induced by paralysis. Many scholars have examined Lute's scattered comments concerning illness, disease, and accidents in the, in, in the endeavor to clarify whether the presumed author of Luke and Acts can be identified with the physician whom Paul mentions as a doctor and traveling companion. 
While Luke's vocabulary was originally compared with contemporary Greek medical terminology, the early scholars' evaluation of Luke's terminology as professional has mostly been discarded. The complex issue is ultimately probably an indeterminable, since apart from the disparity in comparison and question of whether and or uh, to what extent ancient medical writers employed an exclusive medical terminology, as well as whether Luke would necessarily have used it in writing for a lay readership, is difficult in its own right. The biblical attitude towards medical practitioners was firmly an antagonistic. Since God's sovereignty lies in ordering, striking, and restoring life, individual and corporate, quote, it is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and, I, and it is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand, Deuteronomy 32, 20, 39. Little room existed for human agency in, in the alleviation of suffering, uh, the Tanakh relates that in the 39 years of his reign, Asa became diseased in his foot and his feet. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease he did not seek the Lord but the physicians. Second Chronicles 16.12 The reference obviously comparing the latter favorability with trust in God's healing power. Jeremiah similarly mocks physicians' capacity, asking, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of my daughter and my people been restored? While physicians were evidently known during the biblical period, neither the priests nor the prophets were designated as healers. Despite the fact that both the latter possessed some knowledge of medicine and natural sciences, the priest functions was to formally distinguish between the ritually pure and impure and not to observe whether, quote, the infection of leprosy has been healed in the leper. While the prophets meditated, God's, uh, mediated God's power in words and deeds. Numerous texts also reflect the clear link between sickness and sin, most evidently in the passages in which God pleads his peoples to turn from back to him and be healed. I have hid my face from this city because of their wickedness. Be behold, I will bring it to it I will bring to it health and healing, and I will heal them, and I will reveal to them the abundance of peace and truth, and I will cleanse them from their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. Jeremiah thirty three, five through eight. Jesus implies this, that sin leads to sickness whenever he tells the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Matthew 9, 2. And, in line with God's statement, defined his ministry in terms of healing sinners. It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Mark 2, 17. A similar link between sickness and sin appears in the inqu inquiries put to to him regarding specific individuals. Re quote, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or my parents, that he should be, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? John 9, 2. Of course, Jesus then turns and says, neither. He, it was, God allowed this so that his glory could be shown in his healing, essentially. Reliance on God's ones, uh, on God for one's cure included prayer for healing. Moses prayed that people bitten by uh, prayed for people bitten by the snake, and both David and Hezekiah turned to God for healing. In his prayer of dedication to the temple, Solomon encourages people, each knowing his own affliction and his own pain, and spreading his hands towards the house, the temple, to make prayer and supplication for God, because he will quote hear from heaven, his dwelling place, and forgive and render each to his according to his will. Second Chronicles six, nine, twenty nine and thirty. Some of the post-biblical books further reflect the connection between sickness, demons, and death, the association which gives rise to rites of exorcism. During the Second Temple period, professional medicine practitioners increasingly began to receive recognition on God's, as God's agents rather than as being perceived as his enemies. A well-known passage in Sirach eloquently describes the development of a more positive attitude towards physicians while retaining a fundamental biblical view of sickness. Quote, my son, in thy sickness be not negligent, but pray to the Lord, and he will make you whole. Leave off from sin, and order your hands right, and cleanse your hearts from all wickedness. Give a sweet savor and a memorial of fine flour, and make a fat offering, and not being, as not being. Yeah, there you go. Then give place to the physician, for the Lord has created him, and he, sent, he that sins before his maker, let him fall into the hands of a physician. That's from Sirach. 
The New Testament text contains several references to physicians. Mark indicates that women suffering from chronic hemorrhages, quote, had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent that time she had and was not a helped at all, but rather had grown worse, Mark 5, 26. Jesus also quotes a well-known proverb, physician, heal yourself, Luke 4, 23. While noting further, while nothing further is known of him, Paul describes Luke as a physician, Colossians 4, 13, 4, 14. Talmudic literature lists the large number of Jewish physicians, including uh, Theodos of Alexandria, many, many. I'm not going to read them all. There's no point. As used in rabbinic texts, the term rofe refers to healer. I mean, we have Jehovah rofe. That's one of God's name. God is healer. The expression uh, rofe uman de de designated either a learned or certified medical practitioner. Once the status of physicians had risen, three basic theories of the cause of physical and mental ailment rose. Commonly, identified as miracle, magic, and medicine. Miracle assumes the intervention of God or gods in human lives, either directly or through the intermediary agent. Magic is primarily a technique, verbal or physical, through which a desired end is achieved, whether a person's own health or his enemy's misfortune. Medicine is a method of diagnosis and prescription of treatment based on combination of theory and observation concerning the body's functions and malfunctions. Sounds like that whole fish brine thing around the hip that they were talking about earlier. While magical practitioners were regarded as the domain of pagan idolaters who ascribed miraculous powers to the things other than God, and sages appear to have maintained no clear distinction between science and the magic in the field of medicine, medicaments ordinating in scientific experimentation which Sirach describes as being created by God just as a physician himself, were also acknowledged to be used in magical practices. In, other, in such cases, although a, po a potion could constitute part of a strictly prohibited idolatrous magical practice, its use in healing was permitted. Whatever is used as a remedy for healing purposes is not forbidden on account of the way of the Amorite i.e. whatever might otherwise have been prohibited as pagan practices allowed it for its healing properties. The potential confusion between magic and miracles could also at times lead to the ambivalent attitude towards miracles and those who engaged in the miraculous arts frequently. Hasidim, or Galilean wonder workers. Yochanan ben Zakai. Ooh, that's actually... Ben, ben Zakai, that's a big guy. I know that name. Rejoinder in the, uh, to the Gentiles concerning the rites of the red heifer indicates that while the procedure might closely resemble magical practices, quote, the corpse does not have the power of itself to defile, nor does the mixture of ashes and the water have the power for itself to cleanse. The truth is that the purifying power of the red heifer is a decree of the Holy One. The Holy One said, quote, I have set it down as a statute. I have issued it as a decree. You are not to permit to transgress my decree. This is the statute of the Torah, Numbers 19.20. The various stories concerning those crippled in one form or another indicate the lameness did not automatically disbar a person from working, although they did not oblige a full, to f they were not obliged to fulfill the law of pilgrimages and were not eligible for priestly service. The lame were said to be frequently employed as watchmen in the cu in the cucumber fields, and uh, a crippled shepherd was said to be able to catch up with his fleeing flock only at the gate of the pen. God, we saw that in the first episode of The Chosen. That's interesting. Those born thus disadvantaged were also perhaps accustomed to beg from an early age. Where male and female orphans needed need to be taken care of, it is said that, quote, the girl orphan is to be maintained first and the boy orphan afterwards because it is not unusual for a man to go begging, but it is unusual for a woman to do so. Interesting. Beggary is said to be the lot of the wicked, the righteous being guarded against falling into it. Wow. The feigning of lameness is a very old begging trick. The Mishnah defines its punishment as not dying until the imposter has actually become like the ones he is imitating, he or she is imitating. That's interesting. 
Professional beggars, both genuine and feigned, frequently sat in the public places in order to make the most money. Since the sorcerers speak of begging in the terms of going door to door, since the sources speak of begging and going door to door, those who sat in the public place, such as the temple, were presumably unable to walk and required helpers to bring them and carry them home. For the temple was an obvious place to practice this trade, the traffic passing in and out providing good business. A Talmudic tradition states that the gates of Jerusalem were not sanctified, i.e. people were not allowed to eat sacrifices in them, because leopards sheltered them under them in, in summer from the sun and in winter from the rain. Hmm. The Nicanor Gate was specifically mentioned as impure because leopards stand there because, le quote, leopards stand there and insert thumbs of their hands into the court. Although the biblical injunction prohibited the blind and lame from entering into the house of the Lord, the blind Biblical injunction prohibited the blind and lame could not go into the temple. Whoa. 2 Samuel 5.8. I'm going to look this up. 2 Samuel 5.8. Whoever attracts the Jebusites must approach the lame and the blind who are David's enemies by going through the water tunnel. For this reason, it said the blind and the lame cannot enter this place. Yeah. Yeah. Need further further reading into that. A Mishnah stipulates the conditions under which a person with a wooden stump could enter. The Talmud also indicates that the lame and the mutilated priest were in fact permitted in the court of Israel and in the court of the priests. Contemporary literary sources do not mention a beautiful gate in connection with either the Temple Mount or the court gates, since the Talmud describes the bronze Nicanter Gate as being a shiny and gold because it was glimmering bronze, and Josephus marks that the Nicanter Gate was far larger than the other gates, having an altitude of 50 cubits with doors of 40 and richer decoration being overlaid with massive plates of silver and gold. This gate is sometimes identified with the beautiful gate referred to here. Traditionally, the place where women suspected of adultery were given to drink the cups of water of bitterness, women were purified after childbirth, and lepers were cleansed. Reports of the gates' pre precise location vary. While the Mishnah describes it, as the eastern, describes it as the eastern gate of the temple court connecting the court from the women and the court of the Israelites, Josephus locates it between the court of the women and the court of the Gentiles, i.e. the outer eastern gate through which only Jews were allowed to enter. According to one gate, uh, one account, the gate was associated with Hasmodian victory over Greek, cap, uh, Greek captain by the name of Nicate, Nic, Nicanor, whose thumbs and toes were suspended from the gates of Jerusalem. Well, the miracle which is associated with the gate is recorded in the Talmud. Nicanor, quote, Nicanor experienced miracles with this door. Our rabbis taught. What miracles could happen at this door? Question mark. It is reported that when Nicanor had gone to fetch the doors of Alexandria from Alexandria of Egypt, on his return to Gaul, arose in the sea to drown him. On his return, a gale, a oh, gale, there we go, a wind, arose in the sea to drown him. Thereupon they took one of the doors and cast it into the sea, and yet the sea would not stop its rage. Then thereupon they prepared to cast the others into the sea. He rose up and clung to it, saying, Cast me in with it. They did so, and the sea stopped immediately. It's raging. He was deeply grieved about the other door. As he arrived at the harbor of Akko, it broke through and came up under the sides of the boat. Others saying, A monster of the sea swallowed it and spat it out on the dry land. Therefore all the gates of the sanctuary were changed from golden ones, with the exception of the Nicanor gate, because of the miracles wrought with him. But some say, because the bronze of which they made uh, had a gold hue, our Eliezer ben Jacob said it was Corinthian bronze, which shone like gold. Oh, fun backgrounds. All right, guys. Um, I'm not going to go too far, mostly because nobody's coming in. So I'm going to call it. Plus, I got stuff to do today. I was just going to do as much as I could. Those are very technical stuff. I mean, we literally just read about gates and physicians. That was kind of cool, reading about terms for lameness and limitations of lameness and all that. Um, but I think we're going to call it. 
not too much traffic today. Nobody can really hear this anyway. Nobody watches the VOD, so I'll go ahead and uh, call it, and then we'll get back to it later. Um, God bless. Thanks for coming in. Anybody who came? I kind of want to see what's going on over here. Rope physics aren't your thing. Then you might have missed the... All right, enjoy your day. Thanks for coming in. We're going to raid Deadly Deal with our one viewer who's not really a viewer. <laughs>